All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to another session of the Global Middle East Seminar, a new webinar series exploring the modern history and international relations of the Middle East. Today's session will focus on the history of nuclear politics in the Middle East, featuring speakers Masa Ruhi and Hassan Elbatimi, who will be joined by Or Rabinovitz and Eliza George, both of whom have graciously agreed to provide initial comments to begin a discussion that in the second part of this event, we hope will include many of you in the audience. The Global Middle East Seminar is the product of a partnership between the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and Bill Kent University's Center for Russian Studies, represented here today in the audience and on the panel uh, by professors Eliza Gorge, George, uh, professors Honor Ishii and Sam Hurst. I am Christian Osterman and I have the privilege to direct the History and Public Policy Program at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC and will serve as your chair and moderator today. Future sessions will have other chairs uh, involving our partners from Bill Kent. The goal of the Global Middle East Seminar is to bring together scholars of, middle, of the Middle East to explore new and policy relevant findings, insight, insights and publications of the region's recent past. The idea for the seminar was born after our two organizations launched a partnership and conference on new Middle East archival sources hosted by Bill Kent University in the fall of 2019. Workshop was really productive and exciting with some really great discussions about new archival leads, plans for future workshops, publications. But of course, the pandemic threw a wrench into these plans and we decided to move forward with this webinar series that would allow us to build and expand on the connections we made in Birkent. In fact, we're hoping that with this webinar series, we can turn the pandemic restrictions on travel and the like into an opportunity to bring together people, experts, scholars, and others who are, might otherwise not have been able to join a conference halfway around the world. We hope that these sessions can help foster a network of like-minded researchers of different backgrounds and become a forum for the exchange of new research and archival finds of contemporary Middle East history. A few thanks I do here before I introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, we are grateful to honor Sam and Eliza for the partnership with Bill Kent University. And we appreciate the support that Bill Kent has given uh, to uh, this joint endeavor. Um, at my end, I'd like to thank the History and Public Policy team, in particular, Kian Byrne, who co coordinates uh, this Middle East work at our end, and also my colleagues, Chuck Kraus, Aaron Scrimger, and Peter Bierstecker as well as the Wilson Center's uh, uh, John Tyler, who provides uh, all of us with the, these marvelous technical opportunities to connect. Uh, big shout out to John and the Wilson Center's external affairs team. We also greatly benefit here at the Wilson Center from collaboration and support uh, by the M Wilson Center's Middle East program, shared by Ambassador Jim Jeffrey and directed by Marissa Korma, and we appreciate their partnership very much. Before I introduce our speakers, a quick word about the format for the discussion today. Today's session is being recorded and will soon be posted on the Wilson Center and Bill Kent University's websites. For the Q&A portion of the event, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raised hand function in the Zoom app. Once the moderator calls on you, you will be prompted to unmute yourself please press yes, and then you will be able to talk. You can start getting in the queue as soon as you like, right now. Please introduce yourself to the speakers once we call on you. We, try to, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. For our second GMES panel, we are very excited to have some of the leading experts on nuclear history of the Middle East with us here today. Speaking first will be Dr. Hassan Elbatimi from King's College London, who will provide the Egyptian perspective, particular in the early Cold War period under the leadership of Gamal Bel Nasser. Dr. Elbatimi is a senior lecturer at the War Studies Department at King's College and an affiliate uh, 
researcher at, at Sciences Po in France. He has published extensively on international politics and arms control issues. And in 2018 was awarded the McGovern Grant Prize by the Non-Proliferation Review Journal for his research on Egypt's lead up to the 1967 Arab-Israeli War. Dr. Albatimi was also instrumental in helping to organize a conference in Cairo just about a year ago on the history of nuclear politics in Egypt, co-organized by the Wilson Center and American University of Cairo. I'm very pleased now to turn the mic over to Hassan. Hassan, a warm welcome to the Global Middle East Seminar and the Zoom room is yours. Excellent. <clears throat> thank you so much for the very kind introduction and for the invitation. I want at the outset to thank the Center for Russian Studies uh, at Bill Kent University and the Wilson Center for organizing uh, today's event, uh, but also the series, which is very promising and very exciting. Um, I also want at the outset to pay special thanks to uh, Christian Osterman and the team at the Wilson Center, Kian and Chuck and others, for all the work that they are doing to advance and support uh, research in this field. Um, I am going to uh, share a PowerPoint presentation and do an experiment here because I've never presented this in such a condensed form in like 15 minutes. Uh, so bear with me while I do that and I hope I can cover everything that I want to do um, in time. So um, the topic of my presentation today is um, an episode of, I hope you can now see my slides um, clearly at your end, um, an, an episode of diplomacy really um, um, from long time ago, we're talking here about the 60s between the US president at the time, um, Kennedy, um, and Nasser that perhaps uh, unfolded over three years, uh, the full duration of Kennedy's uh, presidency, short presidency um, in, in the US and the Egyptian president who at that time had been president, had been in control since 1954, but formally uh, since 1956 as president of um, a new republic. Um, and it's this period of history, I think, is interesting because in the long <clears throat> overview of U.S.-Egyptian relations, this was a time when the two countries, specifically during the Cold War, where there was a lot of ups and downs and many downs in the relationship, this was a time where there was a conscious and clear, concrete effort for both countries to engage on different terms. Um, and, the, and that relationship between Nasser and Kennedy and their administrations at that time sits kind of like between an earlier episode that is perhaps defined more by confrontation and the Eisenhower, um, I mean, you're reminded by the Eisenhower doctrine in the Middle East that's basically aimed to contain Arab nationalism, which Nasser was a key figure of. Uh, or uh, sort of after that followed by the Johnson administration, which in, in Egypt is, is very much tied to the 1967 Arab-Israeli war and the US position in that, um, and, and actually saw a significant deterioration perhaps from 1965 onwards. So this is um, a, a relationship that sort of like is taking place between these two sort of like um, almost kind of like confrontational and, and rocky relationship. So that's in the broader trajectory of, of the relationship. I want to focus specifically on, a, on an episode of diplomacy that related to uh, nuclear weapons. And that's the focus of, of, um, of this presentation. And it's based on um, some research that I've been doing uh, for some time now that involved a lot of archival research, including Kennedy Presidential Library, Johnson's uh, Presidential Library as well, including also some private archival collections uh, from Egypt and from the US as well. And what you're, what you're seeing is, is the product of, of that research. I think the starting point of this episode of diplomacy, and I hear us specifically looking at the nuclear dimension, there are other dimensions of this relationship between Nasser and Kennedy. The starting point of this is obviously Dimona, which came um, into prominence and significance towards the end of the Eisenhower administration and perhaps inherited 
by the Kennedy administration as they moved into, into office. The story of how it was discovered, Dimona, the Israeli reactor, is, uh, is well known and has been um, uh, studied and, and written about extensively by, by many scholars. I'm not going to go into detail of this, but what I'm really keen to, to highlight is it was very clear when the Americans started seriously uh, to consider the impact of Dimona that the Arab reaction will be significant and severe. This is a, a quote from a 1960 National Security Council meeting. I think this was actually even one that is uh, joint, uh, as in involved some members of the new Kennedy administration before they move formally into office. And that issue was raised that the Arab reaction to the Israeli facility will be particularly severe. So this is what the Kennedy administration inherited. Very soon after that, it came clearly to the fore in 1960. And this is when Ben-Gurion made uh, an announcement about uh, Dimona being a nuclear reactor in 1960. And um, that triggered a very strong and clear reaction very shortly after that in Nasser uh, in a speech, um, speech originally designed to uh, commemorate uh, the Suez crisis, uh, a key event in Nasser's legacy, but then was used to sort of like discuss Ben-Gurion's announcement. Uh, and Nasser was very uh, sort of like angry by that uh, announcement that Israel was building a nuclear research reactor um, in Dimona. I've listened to that speech and actually um, uh, it, it contains a lot of different messages and you kind of see kind of like Nasser's perhaps thinking about this was going in different directions. So at some point Nasser's response was like, we're not going to be intimidated by nuclear weapons and look at Suez where we sort of confronted big nuclear powers and we were not really worried about that. At some other points he would refer to this as propaganda. This is just like designed to scare us. Uh, or this can be a cover for imperial powers to provide Israel with nuclear weapons. So really sort of like uh, he's going in different directions and it was an improvised speech. And I think part of it is, so this was not really written. So this was him speaking on the fly without very without written remarks. Um, but then also there was uh, some bite to what he said. So he was clear to make the points that if we became positive that Israel was building nuclear weapons, then this means war between us and them. Uh, he was keen to highlight this is something that would not be accepted by him or by Egypt. Um, and at some other points, he said also, we will get them nuclear weapons, whatever it takes if Israel goes down the route. So clearly what happened here was that nuclear politics came to the fore, perhaps in, in, in a way, uh, specifically between Egypt and Israel, perhaps in a way that we've not seen as significant or as at that high level of political leadership between the two countries. So that was December 1960, a very close succession, two speeches on the issue. And I think in, in total, they highlighted to this new administration, Kennedy coming in, was really keen on reframing relationship with Nasser and in Egypt at the time that he needed to do something there. So what was the Egyptian assessment of uh, the impact of Dimona on Egypt? I mentioned uh, previously that there was a lot of there was an acknowledgement that this will have, you know, significant impact. So, so how did they actually think about, like, what are the options? What is it that they were concerned about? So one of the things was concern early on that Egypt might go nuclear in response to a nuclear Israel, and that was a concern. And, and the US government um, spent significant, uh, invested significant effort into following developments in what Egypt was doing in the nuclear program. But their ultimate conclusion that the Egypt's effort was not really serious in the nuclear field, that they were not really, you get the clear sense that following what Egypt was doing in the nuclear program, that, that that was not really one of the things that they were really worried about. Uh, the program was very early at its stage. It was sort of like moving in directions that are not um, sort of causing uh, them clear alarm or an anxiety. But that remained a theoretical option that, and one that they thought about. One of the things that they really worried about is that Egypt would abandon non-alignment. And, and go into the communist camp one way or the other. That this would be Egypt's response to a nuclear Israel aligning with another nuclear power. Um, and this can take the form of either Egypt inviting the Soviet Union to place nuclear weapons on their soil, or actually worry that China might find a role uh, to play here by, find, by, by you know, giving some kind of, and at that time, China had not exploded a nuclear device, but it was known that they were moving ahead in that 
direction. So basically, Egypt might think its global alignments differently and abandon non-alignment and sort of like goes closer to the Soviet uh, uh, or the socialist communist side of the Cold War. There was clearly uh, worry about war in the Middle East, that nuclear tension can lead to uh, uh, military conflict. And specifically for the new administration going into the White House, wanting to actually re-envision relationship, not only with Nasser, actually, Kennedy came in with an, I think, an idea of reaching out differently to the third world, and Nasser was, I think, part of that. Um, and, and this was something that they were worried about, that, the, you know, how, how are they going to manage that relationship in the context of these nuclear tensions coming to the fore? So the U.S. administration, Kennedy administration, I think, invested significantly into trying to engage Cairo in a discussion on nuclear um, issues at the time. One of the early instances was through uh, Dean Rusk, uh, who at that time was Secretary of State, met, uh, so we're talking about sort of events flaring up in December 60, February 1961, meeting up with the Egyptian ambassador, now the new administration firmly in, in place, um, and discussing the issue with them, and the key was providing assurances. So um, he would he relayed assurances. We had received assurances from both Israel and France that they had made clear that the reaction the reactor was for peaceful purposes and not for weapons production. He also made uh, wanted to assure the Egyptian ambassador, Egyptian government, that the U.S. government is opposed to the spread of nuclear weapons. They are not part of of that. And and interesting, the Egyptian ambassador at the time mentioned uh, or proposed like, well, if, if with all these assurances, like perhaps then we can have like UN inspections, which is something that will come up later. Kennedy also got, got involved. And I think, and also this is a sub, uh, topic that has been written a lot significantly, uh, at significant length uh, before uh, Kennedy personally got involved in part because he had his views about nuclear and nuclear spread more broadly, uh, but also I think because it interfered with what he wanted to do in the Middle East. Um, and, and the issue was raised, including in the uh, only meeting that they had Kennedy and Ben-Gurion as heads of state, they met before when Kennedy was senator, um, uh, where the issue was discussed. And, and here also you can sort of see that the, the, the thinking like about the audience of what Israel was doing was really something that was concerning the US administration. So in a famous quote, Kennedy told Ben-Gurion, appearances really do matter. Like a woman should not only be virtuous, but also have the appearance of virtue. Um, um, so, so really pushing hard, you know, that, you know, whatever assurances you're giving us, that needs to be substantiated. He's thinking like there is an audience to this and I'm worried about the Arab reactions. As part of that, several um, uh, inspection visits were arranged where US scientists would go and visit Dimona and report their findings. And some of the pressure was applied as well so that these findings would be shared with the Egyptian government and other Arab governments. Um, and this led to a series of uh, inspections into Demona. I mean, I'm not sure to what extent you can call them inspection visits, perhaps, by, by US scientists uh, throughout the 60s. Um, and if you look into the early 60s, every single time one of these visits would take place, like a message of assurance would be uh, sent to Cairo. This is what our scientists found. Um, it's usually a reassurance in tone. Um, um, and including phrases like happy to renew to you the personal assurances we believe this reactor is exclusively for for peaceful purposes and here the that engagement that communication with Cairo was really part of of this so this is also after the the second visit including here a quote from a memo inform him Nasser and confidence that a recent visit by American scientists to Demona uh, enables US government to assure uh, confirm Israeli statements that reactor intended for peaceful purposes only repeat, no, repeat, no evidence of preparation for nuclear weapons production. Um, obviously, that was not what was going on. But another strand of this is that the administration also felt they needed to have an initiative. It's not only just enough to provide these assurances and sort of en engage in talks. Um, and an issue presented itself that there might be the US administrations, you know, always coming into power, thinking about like, what can we do in the Middle East, Arab-Israeli conflict? Uh, what initiative can we put forward? And and at that time, an opportunity sort of like emerged where they can think about uh, putting together an arms control proposal in the service of Arab-Israeli peace. So in the context of thinking about what is it that we can propose as a new administration in the Arab-Israeli peace, William Polk, who at that time uh, 
was policy planning council of the state uh, department made that proposal that this is an uh, an issue that we can push forward as part as part of our peace uh, um, um, engagement in the region so arms control in the service of arab israeli peace um, and I quote from him, his memo, arms control is here considered as a means of approach to a long-term solution of the whole problem rather than an end of itself. This was picked up very swiftly by a very uh, uh, prominent guy in the, in the White House at the time, Robert Comer, a very active uh, national security staffer working on the Middle East uh, issue, sent, writing to Kennedy, this is the most prom promising card available to us in the Arab-Israeli game. The US, as, as a result of this, uh, this idea, started an incredibly uh, meticulous uh, effort to study the uh, capacities and, and capabilities of regional states when it comes to nuclear, chemical, and biological, and other weapons. It's very interesting studies that I had the opportunity to go through them in the US archives. Um, and this was all backed by a security action memorandum that the US produced. As part of this idea came that we are going to send a secret mission to Cairo by this person, um, John McLoy. Um, um, and they asked Nasser to receive, uh, to receive John McLoy in a secret discussions about this new proposal, arms control proposal in the Middle East. Nasser at that time worried about two things, worried that at that time there was a lot of, there is a strong campaign, public campaign against his own missiles program, which unlike the nuclear was actually making some progress, um, although ultimately was not very successful. Uh, but also worried that he was not really sure whether McClough is not going is just coming to Cairo or also going to Israel. So the fact that, well, is it this only targeted at me or also Israel? Ultimately he decided to receive the the envoy and John McCloy uh, travels to Cairo as a presidential envoy in a secret mission, June 1963, meets Nasser twice on their own, without the presence even of the US ambassador who was briefed later on the meeting. And in the and in that meeting, uh, McCloy uh, would deliver messages. Uh, U.S. messages to Nasser, uh, talking to him, uh, the nuclear weapons are fantastically expensive, they are, uh, you know, th they're not really not needed in the Middle East, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the U.S. could not ignore the issue that, um, in, in slight contrast, there's a slight change of tone here, because earlier there were like assurances, but because they wanted to get Nasser on board, so they were starting to tell him, well, actually, Israel is also doing some stuff here. This is a sizable reaction, could be used for purposes of manufacturing material for using weapons and so on. Um, so the proposal was, um, was basically, let's have a secret arms control agreement between Egypt and Israel on nuclear weapons and missiles with the US assistance and verification. So that was ultimately the proposal was given to Nasser. Can expand on that in the q and but for the purpose of time, I, I'll move forward. How did Nasser uh, react? So uh, re records of, of the meeting shows that Nasser like repeated several times, and this is verbatim from the a quote from the, from the record of the meeting, that I could report to the president that he had no intent or desire to manufacture nuclear material and he had no intention of attacking Israel. Nasser talked a lot about his missile program, some of the issues that they are facing uh, with that program. But then he started to raise some issues with the US proposal. He said, like, I cannot really accept as sort of leader of Arab nationalism, like a secret deal with Israel. Um, or I cannot do a bilateral arrangement without a broader Arab-Israeli settlement. He was not averse, so Nasser wanted to keep the door open. He was not averse to renunciations, but he, he keeps referring to a collective setting, the importance of doing something that not really, a, you know, sort of covers us and Israel or the region, but something broader, something more international. Um, a collective setting is what he uh, had called it. Um, and he proposed an international action against proliferation of nuclear, where all the non-nuclear powers in the UN might make the same commitment. And um, he also said, like, I'm not, I'm not averse to providing uh, informal assurances that Egypt, that he had no intention whatsoever of engaging in nuclear weapons. He had no intention of attacking Israel. Um, so Nasser, said, Nasser basically said like, well, the political situation there is, is difficult. I cannot do a, 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 a deal in secret. This would compromise my leadership. Uh, I, I, the substance I can engage with, but we need to th be creative about how that substance can be addressed and proposed collective settings. In the US, uh, this was seen um, uh, as uh, by the different people who sort of like wrote assessments uh, of it. 
um, including McCloy, that you know, Nasser's main motivation uh, and attitude to our proposal was based on political sensitivities. Sheer military considerations were not the main factors. John Badeau, um, who was the US ambassador in Egypt at the time, uh, said the US was not resented for raising the question. Nasser's rejection based almost entirely on political rather than military and financial consideration. Comer, the, the dynamo and the brain, brains behind all this, none of us are too discouraged with these initial results. There is still a chance we can get Nasser signed on to some kind of scheme. Um, and then this led to a piecemeal diplomacy that resumed, that pretty much ended with uh, Kennedy's premature death um, in, in 1963. Um, so final thoughts, I'm realize I'm, I'm really behind on time. Um, so I would just like want to leave you with three final thoughts um, on this. Um, I think we see a less familiar side of Nasser that emerges in the secret diplomacy. One that is open and ready to meet the US some way along the way um, uh, and keen for a measured rapprochement. Um, I mean, you can only, I mean, you can you, you can see how he was keen sort of like to receive McCloy the discussion that he had keep that line of communication open with with the, with Kennedy and in and his administration and in and the frankness to which he discussed these issues with with the presidential envoy shows some kind of openness from Nasser and I think this is a less familiar side of him that uh, not many of his biographies um, sort of um, capture. Um, but we also see that some of the issues that sort of bedeviled US-Egyptian relationship under Kennedy, and including the nuclear dimensions, this remains an unresolved uh, I was, was a structural issue that sort of complicated improvement of relations. It, because, because Demona was unresolved, the US had no specific real sort of answer to Demona, and therefore it, it remains something, an irritant in that relationship, one that, it, that is, you know, that was not properly resolved. Um, I think also this is this period of diplomacy is key because it highlights this is a key period where um, that that is actually incrementally closing on dealing with um, uh, Demona. We see after that um, Johnson administration coming in, a realization most of the time that you know that it's already too late to do anything about Demona, and it's, the question is how you know, we can actually live with it. So I think this also highlights the importance of, of these diplomatic discussion and US thinking at the time about how to resolve it under, under Kennedy. I hope I have not uh, exceeded uh, my time too much, but this is what I wanted to share with you and happy to continue the discussion in the Q&A. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hassan, for this fascinating uh, story. Um, uh, we'll move right on to our uh, second speaker. Um, this meeting is really a confluence of two lines of programming within the History and Public Policy Program, our Middle East documentation work in partnership with Bill Kent, as mentioned, and the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project, a decade-long effort by um, the program with various partners to uncover new sources and to build new intellectual capacity on nuclear history research. Our next speaker symbolizes this coming together of these two sort of strains of activity, Dr. Masa Ruhi. She will, Dr. Ruhi will discuss the history of Iran's nuclear policy and the lessons to be learned from the past as the US and Iran look towards the restart of the JCPOA negotiations in the coming months. Dr. Rui is a research fellow and associate professor at the National Defense University, where she focuses on nuclear policy and security strategy in Iran and the broader Middle East. Prior to joining NDU, she was a research fellow in the Nonproliferation and Nuclear Policy Program at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, where she co-directed a track two project on the geopolitics and nuclear issues in the Middle East and continues to do so now as an associate. We're also delighted to say that Dr. Rui is a veteran of the NPHP boot camp. Um, and so we're absolutely delighted to feature her here. Let me just note that uh, she has a forthcoming book on grand strategy, security, and nuclear decision making in Iran, which we're all looking forward to. Masa, welcome back. The room, the Zoom room is yours. <laughs> 
Thank you, Christian. It's such a pleasure um, to, to be here and, and, and thank you for, for having me uh, and, and thank you for all the great work that you have been doing. And, and you mentioned the nuclear boot camp, which is one of the you know highlights of uh, what I've done in my research throughout the years. And so I highly recommend it. Um, and I also have to mention that it, um, I, I'm always a little bit nervous being amongst these esteemed group of historians because I don't consider my, myself a, a historian. So please bear with me, you know, it's especially hard to follow uh, the incredible presentation and, 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 and the historical um, encounters that, that Hassan mentioned. Um, what I will try to do and what I've always believed in in my work is, is I've always um, looked into history to see what lessons um, we can draw uh, for our upcoming challenges. I have to give a quick disclaimer, which is um, everything I share with you today are based on my personal views and my personal research and do not represent um, the views of National Defense University, Department of Defense, or the US government. Um, as we are heading um, towards I hope not, I hope that the JCPOA can be revived, but whether the revival of the JCPOA and the follow-on negotiations or the failure of the JCPOA and, and, and renewed negotiations on nuclear issues with Iran, I feel like more than ever, we need to look back at how the negotiations in, 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 in the past sort of, uh, what were, the, what were the, the failures, what were the success stories and what we can learn from it um, to, to try to avoid missed opportunities in, in, in the future. And there are a couple of things that I will, so I will only try to share some ideas of, of things that I think are critical to understand as we move towards um, uh, a new sort of era of, of, of nuclear talks with Iran either way. And I hope that we will not enter another round of as we were during 2003 until J JCPOA is sort of a, a diplomatic impasse. And I, I hope that we can sort of make uh, steps uh, forward as, as, uh, as time passes. So there's one thing that I would mention and, and most of my research is always focused on post revolution in Iran and, and nuclear policies and security strategy ever since then. But I think it's important to just make a note, uh, a general note about which we, people tend to sort of overlook uh, in, in many cases is that Iran's nuclear program and Iran's ambitions about having uh, an advanced nuclear capability fuel cycle enrichment goes way back before the revolution during the Shah time. And at the same time, American non-proliferation strategy and their attempt to ensure that Iran does not acquire nuclear weapons also dates back prior to the revolution during the Shah time, uh, where the two countries did not have uh, sort of that as much animosity. So I think it's important to note that this, this sort of uh, friction started before the revolution. It is not the result of the animosity that exists uh, or, or, or started uh, with the Iranian revolution, their new foreign policy approach and the hostage crisis. Obviously that was sort of the turning point of uh, in, in US-Iran relations ever since. What I do think has been the first of uh, the, the first sort of, I would say, cornerstone of the evolution of a, of a nuclear strategy or nuclear thinking policy since the revolution is the experiences during the Iran Iraq war. And I don't get into the details of it. I'm happy to discuss it during the discussion or Q&A. But I, I think if, I, if we were to draw three broad sort of observations from how that has impacted Iran's national security strategy and its nuclear policy, I would say there are three uh, sort of points that we, need to, that we need to keep in mind. First is that it highlighted that Iran's conventional capabilities are really weak compared to the adversaries that is fighting. And so it really needs to invest on asymmetric deterrent capabilities in the future. And at the heart of that sits Iran's nuclear program as well as Iran's missile program, which is not the topic of today, but sort of I, I wanted to mention that. And it's sort of Iran's network of influence or its support for non-state actors in the region. So these, these three. But the nuclear program is sort of where they, they realize that this might be, you know, um, 
a, a, a nuclear sort of hedging strategy might be a very effective deterrent tool to prevent future attacks. The other observation that impacted the foreign policy thinking was um, what, what the whole debate about domestic enrichment centers around, which is independence. And while the idea of independence started with the, revolutionary, with the revolution and some ideology surrounding a revolutionary foreign policy, it was really cemented, not by that, but with the experience that Iran was fighting Iraq during the war and the almost entire international community was supporting Iraq. And so Iran felt like it's fighting it's, it's the world against Iran. And I wanna add a caveat here that when I present these perspectives, by no mean, I, I, I mean to imply that these were like Iran did not pursue policies that caused this isolation. Hostage crisis, as I mentioned, uh, many of their regional uh, policies that they're pursued, uh, their human rights violations, etc. So there's a whole array of things that Iran was pursuing that caused this reaction from the world or partially caused this reaction from the world, which I won't get into, but I wanted to caveat this, that it does not came out of the blue. Nevertheless, this was the experience that they felt. And so the isolation, again, reinforced the idea that they need to have domestic endogenous capabilities. So those asymmetric capabilities, particularly the nuclear, um, has to be endogenous. And then there were also several other experiences where they had ongoing contracts with other countries, uh, Russia, Germany, on their nuclear program, where as a result of the, the sort of souring of the relationship with those countries, those were not completed. So it sort of reinforced this idea that Iran has to sort of pursue or, or master the technology and the fuel cycle endogenously without relying on sort of um, uh, you know, foreign uh, assistance. And the third, and so this was sort of the, the, uh, the isolation had another, which I call sort of the third observation for them, which is not very, you know, very much discussed, but I think it's nevertheless really important and impacts the nuclear thinking, which is it, it gave rise to a strategic vision in Iran, which said, well, we don't want to continue to be isolated because the experience showed that this is not a sustainable and effective foreign policy if you are at odds with the world. Um, because if there is another war, if there is another conflict, they find themselves in the same situation. And that meant there was a, an attempt and a strategy to normalize relations with the world. And that gets me to their sort of how they're thinking about, to their, to, about their nuclear policy ever since, which is, it was this idea that they need to maintain a balance in advancing their nuclear capabilities to where they want, um, but at the same time, not at the cost of complete isolation. And that continues in their thinking today. And so every time as part of the, the you know, facing a choice of whether to develop a bomb and follow North Korea's footsteps at any point, or stop short of having a bomb, this is exactly where sort of the debate in Tehran uh, sort of takes place, which is, first of all, there is a big risk of having a military strike on their nuclear facilities. So there, it's a big if whether if they want to you know, build a weapon, they can do so successfully without getting militarily attacked. But even past that point, even if they're, they're, they believe they can do so, there has always been this perception that that would mean that the isolation will be cemented for a long period of time, similar as it has been for North Korea. So that has been one of the barriers in the political debate that they would prefer and, and what they call a Japan option to, to move towards having a, capa a nuclear weapons capability uh, and being one political decision away from it, which is still unacceptable by the international community, um, but not crossing that threshold. And it sort of it, it has shaped this whole vision in, in Iran that this is sort of how they want to move along. But if you look at then the history of the negotiations, I would start sort of with 2003 onwards, where um, you see Iran engaged with the Europeans first and then with the P5 plus one and the JCPOA, et cetera, you can see how it's continuing to balance 
um, these desires, right? So they would they would be willing to make compromises at different times on the advancement of their nuclear program in return for diplomatic incentives, for economic incentives, because part of their objective or overall strategic objective is not just uh, having nuclear weapons for survival, but also advance into a normal regional power into the world and sort of rebuild those relationships. And if they cross that line and develop a nuclear weapon, that will no longer be available to them. That option will no longer be available to them. And I, I, I finish with this final thought, which is, but it's important to look at, the, again, if you look at different parts, uh, different times where they have been looking at whether they make a compromise or what kind of compromise they make or not, you can find where the red lines have been, et cetera. And, and one thing that is really important is that their threat perception is instrumental in how they keep that balance. So for instance, under the maximum pressure strategy, one of the key observations in sort of Iran's political discourse on their nuclear issue has been that if they believe that the route towards normalizing, advancing as a, as a regional power is not available to them at all, um, then there is the likelihood that the debate will shift towards, well, if you're not getting that benefit, we might as well have a nuclear weapon so that at least we have the security benefit of the that benefit of the uh, of having a nuclear weapon, and so that was a, a time where I would say for the uh, for the first time ever since sort of uh, the Iran Iraq War and around 2003 when Iran was facing a serious threat uh, by uh, by Iraq prior to the to the U.S. attack on Iraq, it, when you have like really high threat perceptions and Iran is seriously considering that as an option. Again, whether it's a capability that is very close to a decision or whether it's developing the bomb, it's important to look at what sort of, um, what affects that kind of thinking and which kind of vision is more empowered by their historical experiences. And I think, I, and I end with that, it's, it's, it's really important to understand in, in my view, the historical experiences are a lot more important in shaping the dynamic thinking on Iran's nuclear strategy than um, you know, ideological factors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to sort of look at how they have been thinking, how their thinking has shifted and um, how uh, we can impact that thinking in the future with negotiations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Masa, for um, a really, I think, a stimulating discussion that will um, uh, now, I think, um, echo in the comments by uh, Dr. Rabinovitz and Dr. Gheorghe. We'll start with uh, Ori. Uh, Ori Rabinovitz is a tenure track lecturer in the International Relations Department at Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. Her research focuses primarily on nuclear proliferation and history particular uh, with regard to the Israeli-American relationship. She published her book, Bargaining on Nuclear Tests through Oxford University Press in 2014 and has since continued to publish articles on Israeli nuclear history and international relations through publications like the Journal of Strategic Studies, Diplomacy and Statecraft, Haaretz and more. And we're delighted uh, to have her uh, um, be a frequent contributor to uh, the History and Public Policy Programs Sources and Methods blog. She currently has two articles relating to the Reagan administration's policy towards Israel in the 1980s forthcoming, uh, one on the Reagan administration's uh, response to the Osirak raid, and a second one on the history and legacy of the Israeli Aero Missile Program, and she previewed um, the latter in, 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 a, in a small way in a recent blog post that you can find on our website. Ori, it's wonderful to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christian, for having me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, more than 100 people. It's uh, quite heartwarming for academics such as us to get the opportunity to actually discuss our ideas and to reach out to people. And it's wonderful to see uh, Mahasan, Eliza, and Hassan, and Christian, yourself, and everyone here. Uh, 
it's truly the, the highlight of my week. And uh, before I'll, uh, I'll get to it, I just want to um, briefly comment on how important it is for programs such as this program at the Wilson Center to give the opportunity for people within the area, like an area like the Middle East, which is uh, really far from paradise. <laughs> And uh, the, the fact that we get the opportunity to meet, meet each other and, and discuss and, 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 and touch on this subject, I think it's uh, really invaluable, it's beyond words. Uh, the second thing I want to point to is the importance of uh, archival work in the region. Uh, we've uh, discussed on it uh, earlier and we've heard about uh, Hassan's brilliant uh, research project and uh, Mahas is uh, also have an upcoming book, which is wonderful. And I think in the Israeli case, uh, it's also worth remembering that there are uh, several untapped or relatively untapped archival uh, resources. I wouldn't want to paint a picture and tell you if you just show up and go to these archives, you're going to have a full picture of the Israeli nuclear program. It's not, it's not what we're talking about, but there are several archives which can add and contribute to our understanding of what's, what of Israeli thinking and Israeli geostrategic perceptions. If you go to uh, the archives of political parties in Israel, the Labour Party, the Likud Party, uh, going into the 1970s onwards, certain, even uh, the, the, the kibbutz movement archive would hold lots of collections. And I think that uh, going forward, these are excellent places uh, to start uh, at least fishing for additional information and filling in some of the gaps that we have. And, they don't have to explicitly pertain to uh, the Dimona program. Uh, the, the, the picture is wider and it's very interesting. So uh, with their permission, I'm going to dig in with some uh, uh, comments and thoughts. I tremendously enjoyed both uh, presentations. I was looking forward to them and uh, they, uh, I certainly uh, had my fair share. Uh, I, my, my expectations were met and surpassed. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, with uh, Hassan's presentation, which I thought was fascinating. I think that one of the uh, overarching themes you can glean from uh, Hassan's research in general and the presentation here now specifically is the almost Orientalist American view towards Nasser and towards Egypt, even in the nuclear sphere, even in nuclear history, there is this overarching fear of this over-dramatized, uh, foreseen Egyptian reaction to anything that Israel would do. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, it, it, the, the reality falls short of these very dramatized uh, expectations that you see throughout the 1960s. And, it, and you also see it in the Iranian case, and I think it's an overarching theme. If you consider how Robert Comer and, and officials in the, Kenya, in the Kennedy administration thought that the Egyptians would react. And, if, and going forward to Johnson's administration, you see Johnson as this very uh, friendly president towards Israel, probably the friendliest uh, up until Trump, maybe. Uh, a very friendly president towards Israel and his bureaucracy, his uh, uh, officers and officials, they keep telling him you can't make these overtures and you can't... Uh, uh, let the, let's say the horse run out of the stable because the reaction in the Arab world and specifically the Egyptian reaction is going to be so dramatic and you never see these dramatic overture, overtures actually materialize on the ground and I think that the, the, the example which probably epitomizes it best happens in June 81 and we're going to celebrate it or commemorate it, note it this coming June, the 40th anniversary for the Osirak raid where the, the, a lot of people in the Reagan administration and elsewhere were waiting for this uh, tidal wave of reaction from the Arab world where in fact the Egyptians were kind of happy with it. And you have different reactions from different actors in the region because the fact is, and the Americans sometimes fail to realize it, that the Arab world is much more fractured than they conceive it and that the, the interests that which motivate the different actors are, um, let's say, more nuanced than sometimes you perceive. Now, I'm saying all this without trying to diminish or disagree with Hassan's statement that the Israeli nuclear program was a concern to the Egyptians and was a concern, was a genuine concern to Nasser. And it did factor into some of his calculations, but uh, uh, the, the assessments were, were different, uh, uh, as I see it at least. Um, uh, and I think, and going forward to the 1970s, and this is a, a junction, a research junction where um, my research meets uh, Hassan's research, and we've, we've probably chatted about this uh, later on. We see uh, some of the uh, themes that Hassan has picked on in the early 1960s resurface 
in the mid 1970s during the Nixon Ford era where Nixon has this uh, brilliant idea. He's going to come to the Middle East in June 1974, mere weeks before he's going to leave the, uh, the White House and the Oval Office. And he'll offer uh, power reactors to both Cairo and Jerusalem. But he, he never actually, his officials never actually discuss it with the Israelis. And when he makes the announcement, the Israelis are shell-shocked. So instead of hosting uh, an American president for a first state tour, they're basically running around panicked and we, the documents tell us that they're panicked. They're literally panicking. They can't understand how an American president can come and just offer a nuclear reactor to Egypt. And it goes to show you some of the disconnect the uh, American bureaucracy and the American leadership uh, has when it treats the Middle East, whether it's Israel, whether it's Egypt, especially in the nuclear realm. Uh, in, the in 1974, in the episode of the reactor, we have, the, uh, we have American, American officials talking about how selling reactors to Egypt and Israel, safeguarded reactors, would basically create a sort of an NPT extension because it would catch, and I'm quoting, all the existing or in future nuclear reactors except for Dimona, which of course is something that the, the region is not willing to accept and it will not actually uh, unfold in years to come. Uh, now I'm going to move on with your permission to a few thoughts and comments about uh, Mahasa's excellent uh, uh, presentation uh, on the Jukpoa. And I think that uh, Mahasa's dramatic contribution to our discussion here is uh, the excellent point she made about how we overlook and we tend to overlook the uh, impact of the Iran-Iraq war on Iranian strategic thinking, on uh, the strategic thinking and the strategic threat perception of other actors. And uh, I'm convinced this is something we're going to see a lot of research in the years uh, to come. I think one of the dramatic events uh, which unfolded as a result of the Iran-Iraq war is the, is the brutal breaking of the existing taboo of uh, shooting missiles at civilians. The Iran-Iraq war basically told us that regional leaders uh, have no qualms uh, and have not a single problem with launching missiles at cities. And this is something, this is a strategic perception that will uh, have uh, long lasting ramifications and it will change how the Middle East uh, looks like today. In Israel, it will make, uh, it, it will cause Israeli decision makers to completely rethink uh, their uh, preconceived ideas about the possibility of Israel being on a receiving end of uh, Arab ballistic missile, mi mi missiles launched by an Arab slash Muslim slash hostile state. And we're living, the, we're living the, the reality of this now. But the taboo first broke in that war, the taboo of shooting these missiles at cities, not at military targets. Uh, I'm going to tie into the jackpot, and I'm sure we, Massa will have to field dozens of questions uh, in the Q&A on the jackpot and, uh, and her analysis. Um, if you'll, uh, if you'll uh, glimpse uh, Israeli news website today, one of the websites called Ynet will uh, report will tell you that um, the, the exiting uh, deputy head of the Mossad is very critical uh, of existing Israeli policy towards uh, the Jokpo in general, basically how Israel has handled uh, its uh, Iran policy in the Iran file. And uh, that exiting uh, official basically said, well, okay, you lobbied Trump to leave the Jokpo. Now what do you do? <laughs> where, where, where are, you, are you better off now compared to where you are two years ago? We can go into a very extended discussion, but I think, uh, I think it's very important to understand that in Israel, the debate is not monotonous on the Jokpoa and Israeli interest concerning the Jokpoa and relating to the Jokpoa. And it's very much tied to political questions to our fourth and coming elections. We like our democracy so much, we just keep going to the polls. And I think this is a debate that's, that's gonna stay with us. Last final thought for Israel in the Jokpoa, context, I think the most important question is, how do you make sure that you get a seat at the table, that you can, that you get a seat at the table, not in the Jokpoa, but in Biden's table? How do you make sure that Israeli valid strategic concern regarding the Jokpoa are actually heard? How do you make sure that a channel exists? And Israel's, I think one of Israel's biggest um, nightmares is a rehash of uh, Carter in the late 19, uh, in the year 1980, just before he leaves office where you have his officials saying, well, Israel will kind of just have to live with the possibility that Iraq will go nuclear because the, the channels of communications are so broken down and the attention span of the leadership is just not there. 
So thank you very much. I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you, Ori, uh, for your very thoughtful comments. I think everybody, I mean, they, I think they made clear how um, that you speak uh, based on a deep knowledge of archives um, uh, around the world uh, on this subject. Um, so thank you very much. We're now going to uh, include Eliza in our conversation, bring her into the conversation. Uh, Eliza, another veteran of uh, uh, the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project, who is currently assistant professor in the International Relations Department at Bilkend University. Her research focuses on nuclear proliferation and the evolution of nuclear markets, questions of grand strategy and nuclear alliances, illicit trade and trafficking networks, just to name a few. Her project, The Globalization of the Atom, Nuclear Trade and the Spread of Atomic Weapons, has earned her the International Fellowship for Outstanding Researchers from the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey. Uh, we're also delighted to say that uh, uh, Dr. Gheorghe is uh, uh, alumna of the Wilson Center. She worked uh, at the center, was with us as a fellow, working on a project on Romania and the bomb, Bucharest's nuclear acquisition strategy during the Cold War. Uh, and uh, like Ori and Hassan and Masa, she's been uh, a formidable uh, member of this uh, burgeoning international nuclear history research network. It's wonderful to have you back, Eliza. The Zoom room is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and it's great to see everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's been really uh, my, the highlight of my, of my week and also, I think, my month uh, to hear these fascinating presentations, and I'm happy to chime in with a few comments. Um, I'll start with, first of all, thanking the Wilson Center for everything they have done over their long history uh, in terms of arch archival openness, promoting um, access to archives worldwide. And I would like to uh, reinforce and reiterate uh, a call for uh, many of the governments that we would like to know more about their, their nuclear uh, projects, their nuclear pursuits uh, to, to open up. Um, the pandemic has been a, a pretty bad situation from this point of view because it's been simply impossible to, to access archives, um, the, the, the ones that are open. Uh, but hopefully, with the help of the Wilson Center, its partnerships um, and its efforts to declassify material, we actually have now a lot more declassified and digitized materials than we had before. So thank you for that. Um, my comments uh, will first go to, to Hassan. So thank you so much, Hassan. This is a very interesting episode of Egypt's uh, nuclear history. And I was, I was quite struck by uh, this, this aspect that, of course, maybe it wouldn't really surprise anyone, um, but the, the Egyptian Soviet dimension and how that worried uh, the Americans. Of course it did, because they wouldn't want to see, um, to, to suffer a defeat in this global confrontation that, that they were having with Moscow. But I think maybe that's, may, that's part of the, of the story. And it, it would be very nice to have more sources um, coming online and being digitized from, uh, from Russia. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that maybe we need to investigate more and to see the, the fuller picture is because within the, the US administration, I mean, various administrations, there was this idea that, oh, um, if the Soviets strike a partnership with another country, uh, that will be at our cost, that will be a, a defeat for us. But at the same time, there were assurances made by the Soviets since 1957, at least, that they would not let uh, a junior partner go ahead and use nuclear weapons or acquire nuclear weapons. So this commitment that the US seemed to have uh, been considering at the time, because they weren't fully committed themselves, uh, but the idea of stemming proliferation, trying to uh, fight against the spread of nuclear weapons. That was also something that the Soviets were thinking about quite seriously. Surely they had, um, they had made a commitment and they had shared technology with China and that was concerning for the Americans, but they came back to their senses quite quickly. So by 1960 with the Sino-Soviet split, which is kind of around the time when your story begins, 
um, I would say the leadership in, in Washington realizes that the Soviets are, uh, are much more cautious or are bound to be more cautious from that point on. And, and that is true uh, based on uh, the memoirs of Ambassador Vinogrado, for instance, years later when Sadat uh, goes to the Soviets and asks them for nuclear weapons, the Soviets calm him down and tell him that this is not nothing that they would this is not something that they would consider. So this idea of, uh, of first of all, what it means to be uh, an allied country, especially a country allied with the Soviet Union, which is generally uh, treating its allies maybe a bit less. Um, in a less democratic way than, than the Americans. I, I would be very curious to see what you would have to say about that. And, and maybe the, if you've seen anything in the, in the Egyptian sources about how the Soviets were reacting, how they were engaging with the Egyptians. Um, and then very quickly on, maybe this is actually a question for, for both Masa and, and Hassan. Um, there's been uh, some very interesting recent work being done by Jane Vangman and Andrew Coe on arms control and uh, why it is that sometimes we see these proposals, which should be uh, quite attractive, why we see them uh, not succeeding, why, why do they fail? And they're proposing uh, an argument that I, I actually find very convincing that we're dealing with a trade-off here. It's a trade-off between security and transparency. The more transparent the country's members to this arm contro arms control agreement would be, the more they expose themselves to later attacks by their enemies, including probably by the country that they're signing an agreement with. So you're either going to be transparent, but be a big fat target, or you're going to try and protect your program, maybe build some things underground like Iran did, but raise all sorts of alarm bells and make everybody really uh, anxious about your ambitions. So I'm curious whether you see, you, you talked about how this was only for political reasons that Egypt did not consider this uh, initial approach, this overture from the US. But I also wonder what Egypt was, was thinking it could suffer. What kind of liabilities were involved in, um, in an arms control agreement that they would have with the Americans or maybe with other countries in the region? Um, and now to go uh, to properly to Masa's talk, which I very much enjoyed, um, I'm curious to see how you think about uh, this trade-off and how what, what you think Iran is making of this trade-off, first of all. But then I also had some questions about hedging, which is a topic I've been doing some, uh, some work recently, uh, looking at uh, how dangerous is this? And is it actually a good idea for us to encourage hedging, which may, may end up being the, the result, the outcome of a Biden administration, simply because uh, they're going to try and put Iran back in the box, let's say, but that box is, doesn't mean that Iran's uh, nuclear cap capabilities will completely disappear. So there will be a degree of latency there uh, no matter what. It's, it's basically impossible at this point uh, to remove uh, and to obliterate Iran's uh, nuclear capabilities, especially the enrichment uh, capabilities. So when it comes down to hedging, now Iran has made some really interesting statements um, being a bit more open about its, um, its thinking on, on nuclear weapons, as you rightly pointed out in your latest foreign policy piece. Uh, but Iran is at the same time a very cautious uh, state, or it's, it's a, at least it's aware that it has a lot of um, challenges or a lot of uh, uh, sources that could pose a threat to its security. So when it's thinking about hedging, does it have any sort of role model except for, I mean, Japan is maybe there, but Japan by itself is, has not been um, as open about hedging as other countries such as Brazil, for instance, um, or, or even in recent years, uh, Saudi Arabia. So how is Iran thinking about this, this hedging strategy? Uh, is, it, is, it a, is it planning to, to openly ask for that kind of status or is it going to insert hedging against the will of, of its um, traditional adversaries and, and challengers in the region. So uh, thank you very much to both of you for giving me the opportunity to, to le learn from your work. Uh, and I very much look forward to your answers. Thanks so much, um, Eliza, for um, these great um, 
uh, comments. Uh, let me, before we open it up to uh, our audience, and I encourage uh, all of our viewers to uh, use the raise hand function to uh, indicate that they're interested in, in posing a question or making a comment. Uh, but you can also type um, type the questions into the chat if you prefer. Uh, before doing so, let me give uh, Hassan and Masa a chance to respond to Ori's and, and Eliza's um, questions and comments. We'll start with Hassan, briefly. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, th th this is a great comments and um, and you know prompts for for discussion. I'll I'll take Christian's uh, prompt to be brief. Um, I'll I'll address uh, two points. The two points here, I think. Um, one on the um, you know relationship with the with the Soviet Union, and I think there is something that I want to to highlight about that nature nature of that relationship and how Egypt itself positioned itself you know, during much of the Cold War. Um, and specifically around that time, I think it's around that time that you see that, you know, very, very prominent. So I'm talking about like maybe from the, after the Suez crisis, 1956, um, perhaps all the way till maybe 1967, and then starts to, things start to change a little bit. And that is primarily that Egypt, Positioned itself in a, in in um, in a, in a, between the great powers as a non-aligned country, and and actually also played a massive had an, an aspirations for a leadership role, and and try to to do that. So I'm currently in the process of finalizing a piece on how Egypt sort of like perceived and reacted to the Cuban Missile Crisis happening in 1962. So that touches, is gonna come out with, with the Wilson Center hopefully soon, that touches upon, you know, both the period, uh, but also I think illuminating in, in the sense of how Egypt positioned itself. And there, the, 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 the position is we're getting some stuff from the Soviet Union, we're getting some stuff from the US, but none of them should take us for granted. And I think we sometimes tend to underestimate sort of like the, the how rooted that position is. And I think it goes back to the experience of decolonization and what it means to be an independent country and, and that wave of national leaders assuming positions of power in these countries that identify being a new, identified the, you know, the colonial decolonization struggle as something that would necessarily lead to having an independent foreign policy within some constraints, obviously. So that is a very rooted position. And I'm saying the Cuban Missile Crisis because Egypt at that time also was sitting on the Security Council and played a key role in sort of positioning itself not to be taken for granted by any of these two camps. Um, uh, on on the, the point that, that was mentioned as well, and I, th I think the, the the, the, we tend looking into nuclear politics to underestimate how strong the Soviet Union was on non-proliferation. I think perhaps the the, the Chinese connection um, that ended up in the Sino-Soviet uh, sp split can be an, an 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 exception where the Soviet Union sort of like played a key role in the Chinese um, program. Uh, but I think if you look into the record of the Soviet Union compared to uh, other countries on the on this issue, it's it's going to come across much much stronger uh, in retrospect. But th but also that means that at the time there were also still questions about what actually does that mean. I mean, is the Soviet Union going to use sort of any sort of like semblance of a weakening of Western positions, sort of like either to provide nuclear protection or to nuclear assistance of any source. So that was definitely one of the things that was was considered at the time. I mean, we now know that that, that did not happen. On the question of like liabilities and arms control, and I think the questions that Nasser were probably is thinking when he got that proposal is, uh, first, is it serious? Second, is there any chance Israel can be part of it? Uh, would they actually give give up their nuclear pursuit to be part of a of a denuclearization agreement? I think the, one of the key defining things in in his reaction that I think was picked up by all those who com commented on it uh, um, later was th that he was not ready for a secret uh, deal. I mean, the, the proposal was put as a secret deal, uh, and initially put as a secret deal because it was because the deal with Israel at that time was something that would torpedo his 
his his stature and Egypt's foreign policy in general. Uh, um, so I think these are some of the key liabilities uh, that he was thinking about. Clearly, some of and clearly some of those who made that assessment as well from the State Department, National Security Council, and the U.S. and others. Uh, kept raising that over and over um, again. There are more interesting points to engage with, but I don't want to sort of take too much of, of the time. Perhaps we can get back to them in the rest of the Q&A. Thank you. Massa? Sure, thank you so much. Great um, comments. I'll try to just share some um, brief thoughts on that. Um, on the JCPOA and sort of uh, Ori's sort of great points, um, one of the things that I think is key about JCP, and I've written about it so much, um, is that we should try to avoid letting the, the ideal be the enemy of the good and the necessary, I would even say, not the good, the necessary. And, uh, you know, if you look at critiques of the JCPOA, whether inside Iran from the hardliners camp, whether in the US or in Israel or in the region, everybody wanted more and it was just not possible <laughs> um it's a deal you got to make a compromise somewhere and every side has got to make a compromise somewhere and the idea um in on both sides actually was that this would be an incremental approach to build upon and i think that was what was mostly missed in the debate that this was supposed to be the beginning not the end and unfortunately was treated as an end um, for a variety of reasons by everybody. And that you know, opened the door for a lot of criticism and, and, and for the strategy that, that, that followed. And that goes to you know, Eliza's question about security and transparency, where it is definitely you know, a, a major consideration. You, know, you pointed it out really rightly, this is a consideration and this is partly why um, you know, uh, some of the agreements in the JCPOA, which many didn't like, existed in the JCPOA because there was this, you know, worry that we, you know, we, we find sort of a sweet spot where um, there is an agreement on that there is enough transparency that will assure uh, the world that, you know, Iran will be roughly a year from having a weapons capability. And you know, for Iran, it was also keeping some, uh, you know, some technologies intact and 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 a, and and a future ahead. And I think that will remain to be actually even potentially a bigger problem uh, in the future of the negotiations in light of the 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 archives that the Israelis published. I think that will that will be something that would be really uh, even more uh, as part of the debate uh, moving forward with the negotiations. And that gets me to sort of the issue of latency. Although I, I do add a cap, I wanna add a caveat here that I feel like, and, and all of you probably know, but a lot of people who are working on uh, the crossroads of technology and, and nuclear policy are coming up with incredible projects focusing exactly on this and coming up with new ways and, and innovative ways that one could verify nuclear commitments and arms control without compromising the security and the secrecy part of the, the state that is negotiating. And I think that would be a game changer in, in arms control and, 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 and sort of nuclear field and hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, on the hedging latency, uh, Brazil, yes, Brazil is definitely a model for Iran. And they do understand, I think, that um, that is not an option they can pursue today. But again, the hope was that with the JCPOA comes the prospect for normalization. And with the normalization, then they can pursue uh, a, you know, a, a model like Brazil or, or, or Japan. And obviously there are differences. It's just sort of for the point of reference or, or they, they use this just in terms of saying, we don't want to cross the threshold to build a weapon. Um, and so you know, I, I, I think they understand that this is a long-term game, that they're not going to be Brazil tomorrow or in two years or in five years, but they need to have a, a, a prospect for what this will be to justify the compromises they're making and also to justify the cost 
that they're enduring in terms of advancing uh, their, their nuclear program. So it's sort of a, um, you know, really fine line uh, to balance. And they are very well aware of sort of the perceptions around it, the feasibility of it. And that's part of why they accepted the JCPOA. And what, 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 that's part of why I do believe that there could have been follow on uh, even restrictions had the JCPOA remained in place, had it provided incentives that would reinforce the idea that Iran could actually get a lot on other fronts of its, um, you know, power and security uh, if it if it sort of sets back slowly its nuclear program, not you know completely dismantle it, but with some compromises, it will get something in return. Unfortunately, that did not play out that way, so it remains to be seen how we can find that. Uh, uh, find that balance again. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's uh, bring in some of our viewers. Uh, I'd like to first go to Arlie Arslan, if you could um, please unmute yourself when prompted and ask your question. Uh, I'll also encourage others to use the raise hand function to pose your questions. Ali, uh, please you introduce. Hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Please introduce yourself and pose your comment or question. Uh, okay, uh, I am a, a uh, fourth-year uh, student at uh, Bilken uh, in the International Relations Department, and I am uh, really into the politics of uh, Middle East. And I want to thank uh, all the panelists for um, this great uh, webinar today. Uh, it was amazing, and I have two questions to ask. Uh, the first one is. Of course, when I have uh, Egypt and Iran, I have to compare them. <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind is comparing them. And the question is, um, why did the US policies towards uh, Nasser's Egypt on the one hand, and Iran after revolution, after uh, 200, let's say, uh, differed, why? And of course, to fully uh, propose this question, I have to also ask, uh, why uh, Egypt under Nasser and Iran after uh, 200 differed in their nuclear policies? Uh, why Iran Iran uh, tried to uh, first build or uh, do hedging, but Nasser uh, just uh, directly jumped to the diplomacy part instead of trying hedging or trying to build the weapons uh, to the extent that Iran did? This is one question. And the second one is, again, um, as Eliza uh, asked on uh, the hedging, uh, the question is, um, can Iranian hedging strategy uh, imply balanced powers in the Middle East with respect to nuclear uh, weapons? Could it uh, balance uh, Iran um, sorry, Israeli uh, nuclear power? Or would it uh, provoke uh, Israeli attacks or uh, Saudi hedging, counter hedging, uh, as if Iran was developing uh, nuclear weapons directly. These are the two questions I had in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to tackle them? Massa, do you want to start? And I don't know if Ori or Sure. Yeah. I would like to chime so in. If I take on, because there are a couple of questions that has been written that I think relates to this, I can couple them. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. So uh, one question, uh, thank you for the great questions, by the way. Um, and one question was about sort of the motivation and um, whether other than security, there's sort of, the, you know, the world powers that the Soviets and the US and others had nuclear weapons, whether that was sort of a motivation for Iran. And that definitely was a motivation, I would say, up until the revolution. So if you look at the Shah's time, the idea is that Iran wants to seat at a table, there's the nuclear club, you want to be part of it. Over time, based on how you know the, the international relations treated nuclear weapon, the nuclear proliferation in different states, that perception definitely changed in Iran. Um, and they there was this realization that Iran will not be a world power if it develops a nuclear weapon, that the options that is looking at 
are, are, are North Korea and Pakistan, uh, neither of which was appealing um, you know, uh, to Iran. It was not the end game. They wanted to be a, a, a regional power with the seat at the table and having a nuclear weapon would give them the immunity, but it would not give them a seat at the table, unfortunately. Um, had things evolved differently and the MPT had fallen apart, et cetera, all of this would have been different. But I think given how things unfolded and how successful nonproliferation was, um, over the years, that realization sort of became um, part of Iran's strategy. And that gets me to, um, to a question about sort of regional proliferation, which was posed both in, in, in the Q&A and, and now, um, which is Iran does worry about regional proliferation as well. And that's a part of their consideration not to cross a threshold and have nuclear weapons. And, and that's why they're constantly looking for a sweet spot because they, they know that if they were to cross the line, develop even if they were able to, which is a big if, uh, to have nuclear weapons or develop nuclear weapons, that would actually create their security environment worse for them than it is now. And so that's also part of, part of uh, you know, how they um, how they sort of look at this uh, this dynamic? Thank you. Uh, uh, anyone else would like to chime in on this question? Oh, Ori, well, please. More yeah, of go ahead. streamlining uh, some thoughts on Saudi Arabia and uh, nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. I think, and I'm going to exaggerate a bit, I think that the Saudis and the Israelis are more aligned than we consider, despite the fact that they have, the Saudis haven't officially signed on an agreement like the Abraham Agreement, etc. And I think to an extent, and again, I'm exaggerating, but this is just to give a flavor. I think that they almost see the relationship with Israel, uh, together with the UAE and Bahrain, as uh, almost sort of an Israeli nuclear umbrella over the Gulf not officially, not like in the American capacity with its allies, nothing like that. Um, but to some degree, because these countries are uh, aligned together against uh, Iran, uh, I, I think it's, it's conceivable to, to refer to, to the situation in these, in these terms. And I think that since the Saudis have been so explicit in outlining their immediate um, response to an Iranian uh, nuclear threshold passing traversing, I think it's one of the strongest hurdles uh, towards uh, an Iranian so-called uh, dash to the bomb because it will affect Iran much more than Israel's nuclear capabilities in the, in the short term. And just a thought. Thank you, great. Uh, Hassan? Great, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ali, for the, for the, for the question. Um, yeah, a comparison can be something that is very interesting. You can, you can come out with a lot of interesting stuff, you know, when, when you're comparing countries. But I want to say that the history and the trajectory of the, the countries carry a lot of nuance as well. So it's very important to think in terms of like which period, which direction, and um, like when to start, when to end, because it will change across the sort of like the longer trajectory of how these countries related to nuclear um, issues. I, th I think I, I just want to say something in response to your comment and question, which is that it is also difficult to, it, it is also difficult sometimes to sort of like reduce the discussion and debate in any of these countries into one direction. So, for example, in Egypt, there was a very uh, vibrant debate about, you know, how Egypt would respond, right? And there are different, within every government, there will be different uh, uh, institutions, different uh, political currents who would be pushing and pulling in different directions, right? And sometimes the ultimate policy becomes uh, like the combination of these kind of like competing directions. And um, you see that also with the US and how it would, and how like in, in the bit that I presented and how it dealt with specifically with Egypt in that context, you can very easily see, you know, different currents and different, you know, different parts of the US bureaucracy pushing and pulling in different directions. Um, so I think that is, that is important. But another dimension that I want to, to add as well is, and this is, I think, specifically important for those who are studying nuclear politics, is that we should always be aware that there is a larger, broader context and not look at everything only explicitly uh, through the nuclear lens. Because you'll find that there are a lot of trade-offs and the countries and, and political leaders and 
and bureaucracies have a whole list of issues and concerns. Um, um, and sometimes we're driven by our interest in one thing to, think, to see an explanation through it to everything, where in fact it's much more nuanced and complicated and sometimes competes with other uh, priorities too. Thank you. There are more questions, both in the Q&A and the, the panelists, but I'm afraid we are running, we've run out of time and we'll have to bring this discussion to an end. Hopefully um, some of the questions can, some of the, the folks who post questions can connect with our uh, panelists um, bilaterally. I like to thank Hassan, Nasa, Ori, Eliza for a really rich and wonderful discussion uh, uh, this afternoon, this evening. Thanks to our partners at Bilkent for the uh, incredible partnership that uh, certainly at the Wilson Center, we very much appreciate. Thanks to John Tyler and Jared Thompson and Kian Byrne at the Wilson Center's end for facilitating uh, this uh, um, webinar. As mentioned, the video of the seminar will be up uh, shortly on our various websites. And you can also uh, view the video of our first session uh, on Turkey. Uh, just Google History and Public Policy Program or Global Middle East Seminar, and you should be able to um, call up the video. Um, please join us in a month uh, for a book discussion uh, with Professor Lawrence Lutti on Cold Wars, Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Um, we'll focus, obviously, on the Middle East in the context of the seminar. Um, I would also like to invite all of you to a Washington History Seminar session with uh, Rosie Bashir on Archive Wars, the Politics of History in Saudi Arabia, coming up this coming Monday, March 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Infos again on the Wilson Center's website. Until then, please stay safe and take care. We're adjourned. Thanks so much. This was really great. Thank you. Thank you.